Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today to the By Faculty for Faculty Lecture Series. My name is Janet Blumen. I'm currently serving as Deputy Provost, and it's my pleasure to be here in place of, of Provost Locke, who is traveling and is very sorry to have to miss this wonderful event. And this will probably be Rick's last of these this series that, that Rick himself started in, I think, around 2015 or so. And it's a, a wonderful series to hear from our, our fantastic colleagues like Professor Ashley Webb, who I'll, I'll introduce in, in a minute. Wanted to put in a quick plug for the uh, the, the next two speakers in the series that in these these uh, speech uh, lectures will take place in the spring semester. Emmanuel De Lorenzi in the Earth uh, Environmental and Planetary Sciences Department, and Bathsheba Demuth in the History Department will be speaking in the in the spring semester. So watch out for the details for for that. But today, we are very lucky to have Professor Ashley Webb with us, who is a um, uh, professor in um, is, um, is uh, the Richard and Edna Solomon Assistant Professor of Biology at Brown. Dr. Webb came to Brown um, from a postdoc at Stanford University and a PhD from the University of Washington, and has been here since 2015, I believe you, you told me, which is... Fantastic. Dr. Webb is also a scientific co-founder of Bolden Therapeutics, a company founded to develop strategies to replenish neurons in the diseased brain. Her work has advanced our understanding of the cellular mechanisms that accelerate brain aging and has the potential to reveal new approaches to promote healthy aging and treat age-associated diseases. And on behalf of all of us who are aging, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking on this work. And I would ask you to go as fast as you can. And, <laughs> and so um, the presentation today is, is titled Understanding Re and Rejuvenating the Aging Brain from Basic Science to Therapeutic Development. Um, Ashley, please, please take, uh, take us through your work. All right, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay, it's on. Um, great, thank you so much for the, the kind introduction, for the opportunity to present today and, and tell you about the work that we've been doing. And thanks to all of you for coming. Switch over. Perfect, all right. So in my lab, we are interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms of brain aging and neurodegeneration. And so the plan for today's talk is to begin by telling you a little bit about my lab and our department and the Center on the Biology of Aging. And then I'll get into more detail on the basic biology of brain aging that we're studying in my lab. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing to translate our, translate our work into the clinic and, um, and what, we've been, what we've been doing um, through a startup called Bolden Therapeutics that I started with. Justin Fallon, um, who's a professor in neuroscience, together with Johnny Page, a Brown alum. All right, so normally I start my talk with disclosures. I'm not going to get into this now because we will get into it uh, in more depth later in the talk. Okay, so, um, so as I mentioned, in my lab, we are investigating the molecular mechanisms of brain aging and neurodegeneration. My lab is in the NCB department here at Brown, so that's the Department of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry. And we're actually physically located, um, my lab at least, is physically located down in the jewelry district, also called the innovation district now. Um, and so we are at the Laboratories for Molecular Medicine. We're also called 70 Ship Street, our building. So we're right near the medical school. So not too far away, just about a, a 15, 10 or 15 minute walk from here. And we are also members of a number of centers and, and other departments here at Brown. And so my primary affiliation is with the Center on the Biology of Aging. And when I came to Brown in 2015, this wasn't yet a center. It was, it was an initiative at that time. Um, but since that time, we've grown and we are continuing to grow and we are now a center. Um, but I'm also a member of the Kearney Institute for Brain Science, as well as the Center for Translational Neuroscience, the Center for Computational Biology, and the Center for uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research, um, which is actually a new center at Brown that was just recently established. And I have a secondary appo appointment in the Department of Neurology. And so I wanted to highlight these various centers because the, they, what they're doing is collectively, they're really providing with 
us with a rich environment to, to do the work that I'll, I'll tell you about today. And without the resources from these various centers, I don't think we would have advanced um, as quickly as, as we've been able to advance with our work. All right, so just a little bit more on the Center on the Biology of Aging. Um, the Center on Aging is directed by Dr. John Sedevy, who's here today. And we have in total about 30 faculty. And um, so we have a really fantastic group. And here I'm showing really the, the core members of the Center on Aging. And then I just took a couple of points from our, our website that, that Dr. Sedevy put together. And um, really what we're doing collectively is we're working on the molecular mechanisms of aging. And our aim is to identify biological mechanisms that can extend healthy, healthy lifespan. And so what we're not trying to do is make people immortal. So forget about some of the crazy stuff that you hear about um, in the public domain. Um, really, our goal is to come up with interventions and uh, figure out ways to extend healthy lifespan. So how can we live better, longer? And so these interventions, we hope, will ameliorate the negative aspects of aging. And so some of these aspects of aging are things that are just sort of inconvenient, right? So with age, we don't sleep as well. Um, our body composition changes. But other things are actually more than just inconvenient, right? Women, we undergo menopause. Um, that's not great. Um, and then as we age even more, there are other things that come up which really prevent us from living independent, high-quality lives, right? And so our mobility um, is compromised. And, um, and so these are things that um, we think can be avoided, at least for a longer period of time throughout life, if we can figure out ways to, um, to prevent some of, some of the uh, damage that occurs as we age. And there's another reason that we study aging, which is that aging is the greatest risk factor for a number of diseases. So here I'm showing you a number of the big ones. So heart disease, many types of cancer, diabetes, these are all age-associated diseases. They're not very common in young people, but the older we get, the more likely we are to, to get these diseases. And so in the aging field, we, we believe, and there's a lot of experimental evidence for this, that if we can relieve the symptoms of aging and decrease the damage associated with aging, that we can actually delay um, the onset of these diseases. And again, live higher quality, more independent lives. So in my lab, we study brain aging. And aging is the greatest risk factor for just normal cognitive decline. So this is not disease-associated cognitive decline. Um, in, instead, with age, we're all experiencing slower processing right, of, of information. So um, we, we tend to slow down. Our brains tend to slow down a little bit. And our memory is not quite as good. We don't learn new tasks as well either. So, so there are a lot of aspects of brain function that are, that are compromised even during just normal, healthy aging. And at the same time, there is an increase in prevalence of many neurological diseases with age, including Alzheimer's disease, which is a big one. And it's the one that I'll be focusing on today. And so before the age of 65, almost nobody gets Alzheimer's disease. There are some individuals who have very rare genetic mutations um, that cause them to get Alzheimer's disease in their 40s. And those are mutations that cause early buildup of what's called amyloid plaques, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but really 95% of people who get Alzheimer's disease get it later in life. So not before 65. And then the older you get, the more likely you are to, to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, interestingly, and we don't understand the molecular basis for this, women tend to get more Alzheimer's disease than men. And so um, it's not just because women are living longer. There's something about the physiology and the biology of, of females that really makes us more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. And about two thirds of individuals who have Alzheimer's disease right now are women. And we don't know why that is. Maybe it's hormonal changes. Maybe it's something about um, our chromosome content, which is just slightly different from, from males. Um, but this is an area that we're very interested in in, in my lab. I'm not going to be talking about sex differences in aging today. So we have two big questions in my lab. First of all, what causes brain aging and neurodegeneration? And then second, what can we do about it? 
All right, so this is the team. So um, this is the um, current composition of my lab, as well as a couple of key alumni who have left the lab recently. My lab is mostly graduate students and undergraduates. So we are a very student heavy lab. And we are fortunate to draw students from a couple different graduate programs here at Brown. So we have neuroscience graduate students in the lab, and we also have MCB graduate students in the lab. And uh, we have a couple of undergraduates working in the lab right now, as well as a prep scholar who is um, poised to, to go to graduate school, hopefully at Brown next year. We'll see. Um, and then I have a few postdoctoral fellows that are fantastic in my group, as well as two research assistants who are really important for um, supporting the lab and, um, and assisting with experiments, as well as um, helping with our, our animal work. All right, so we work on two different areas of the brain. One is known as the hippocampus, and the second is known as the hypothalamus. And we primarily work in the mouse system in my lab. And so these schematics here are of mouse brains. I'll get to some human brains in a minute. Um, but this is what this is sort of a cartoon of a mouse brain here. And on the upper left, that's a, a side view of a mouse brain that's been pulled out um, of the skull. And then if you section through that mouse brain at the level of a, a plane that I drew here, um, and then flatten it out, this is what it looks like. And so the hippocampus is the main area of the brain that I'll talk about today. That's this upper area here. And then down below, this is the second area that I've circled, known as the hypothalamus. And so the hippocampus is very important during aging because this is an area of the brain that, um, that functions in learning and memory. Um, it also functions in emotional regulation. And this is a part of the brain that is affected early on in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So I'll talk mostly about that part of the brain today, but I can't help but um, just quickly mention um, this other part of the brain that we're very interested in. It's a more recent area in my lab, um, but the hypothalamus is also a really important area of the brain for healthy aging because this is a part of the brain that has a number of different functions involved in maintaining healthy physiology. And so for example, it's important for um, regulating our appetite and body composition, actually regulation of body temperature, um, reproduction, hormonal control through the pituitary, um, and many other functions that you can read, including sleep-weight cycles and the body clock. So like circadian rhythms, for example, are controlled by this part of the brain. So um, these things are all disrupted with age, yet this part of the brain is actually very understudied in the context of aging, which is why we're, we're very excited about um, digging deep into this part of the brain and, and trying to figure out what's going on there. And um, we do have a couple of recent papers um, where we've investigated this part of the brain. So if you're interested, you can, you can check those out here. But, um, but I'm not going to talk um, more about this part of the brain today. Instead, I'm going to focus on this learning and memory area, the, the hippocampus. OK, so, so back to Alzheimer's disease. So here are just a couple of images of, of brains. There's a healthy, normal brain on the left, and then an Alzheimer's brain on the right. And I think the differences are, are pretty striking, right? So this is a, a late stage. Alzheimer's patient, and um, you can see that there's a lot of shrinkage of the brain, that's atrophy and, or, and degeneration of the, the cells in the brain. And the hippocampus in the human brain is actually down lower, so it's down here. Okay, so it's actually much smaller relative to the, to the whole brain in, in humans, but it's no less important. And that is the part of the brain that degenerates early on in Alzheimer's disease. And then by the time individuals get to the stage that's shown here, you can see that the disease has basically spread throughout the brain. And you can see how, how striking it is that you know, some of the tissue is, is lost. So this is a person with late stage dementia. All right, so a little bit more about the features of Alzheimer's disease and what we know. So there are very specific pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So in this cartoon here, the purple cells, these are neurons or the information processing cells in the brain. There's just a few of them shown here. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease is there's a buildup of protein aggregates that are called amyloid plaques. And that happens in between the cells. So that's these sort of little brown bundles that are shown out here. So those are the amyloid plaques, which are the really first key feature of the disease. But there are other features of the disease that, that we also have um, identified at this point. So um, a second one is the development of neurofibrillary tangles. And those occur inside the cell, and specifically inside neurons. So they're a little bit harder to see in this cartoon, but there are these um, little bundles that are shown 
that are um, showing up in the, in the neuron specifically. So these are also known as tau tangles, and they end up um, all over the brain eventually in Alzheimer's disease. Now, another feature of, of Alzheimer's that has become appreciated a little bit more recently is, um, is the increase in inflammation. And so people with, um, with Alzheimer's have um, an increase in inflammation in cells called microglia, which are actually immune cells that are found in the brain. And it's sort of under, it's still kind of debated whether these, this inflammation is good for Alzheimer's disease or whether it's bad for Alzheimer's disease. It's actually probably a little bit of both. And so you need some of the, um, the inflammation inflammatory cells to be activated because they help to get rid of some of the plaques, but at the same time, the, the inflammation is, the state of inflammation is generally sort of bad for, for the brain because there are a lot of things that are released in the brain like cytokines that, um, that can be bad for information processing. So, um, so this is a, a, a third feature of the disease. And then eventually this results in a loss of connectivity between the cells in the brain. And then eventually these cells will, will die, right? So that's the atrophy and the degeneration that occurs in Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, at this point in time, once we've lost neurons in Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, we don't have a, a way of replacing them. Okay, so a few, um, a few more points I'd like to make about Alzheimer's disease, because one, um, one question I feel like I get a lot is, why is it that we are not doing better? Why do we not understand Alzheimer's disease better? Why do we not have any treatments? Why would we not have a cure? There's so much money going into Alzheimer's disease. So many people have Alzheimer's disease. You know, why is it specifically that, that we're not doing better? So I thought I'd make a, a couple of uh, points here. Um, so, um, you know, to highlight some of the complexities of the field right now um, and in some of the places where, where we are doing better. Okay, so, so first of all, who has Alzheimer's disease? So about 6.5 million people in America have Alzheimer's disease right now. It's probably about 40 million people worldwide, um, but it's probably underdiagnosed as well. So there are many people with dementias and people think, oh, they're just, under, they're just getting old, but they really are developing Alzheimer's disease. So those are unaccounted for here. Um, these numbers are from um, the Alzheimer's Association annual report. They put out a report every year. So if you're interested, it's very thorough and you can really you know, um, dig into to the numbers if you're interested. Um, Alzheimer's disease has a huge cost to our healthcare system, about $300 billion in healthcare costs per year, and that does not account for caregiver costs that are not on the books. Um, there's a huge cost to caregivers um, with this disease that is both financial and it's also emotional. And that's also something that tends to fall on, on women a lot of times. Okay, so, so why is it that we're not doing better? So some of the challenges that we have to understanding and treating Alzheimer's disease. So first of all, Alzheimer's has a very long and slow progression. <clears throat> People tend to um, not present with symptoms until after the disease has probably been developing for maybe even a decade, so for several years. And then they present with mild cognitive impairments, which eventually um, just gets sort of worse and worse gradually over time. And people can live with the disease for many years, even a couple of decades. So this is a long and slowly progressing disease. And the second point that I want to make here, I think surprises people the most, we don't know what causes Alzheimer's disease in all cases. So we have some hints. Some of those come from genetics, right? So genetics doesn't lie. Um, those people that I mentioned earlier who have um, genetic mutations in genes that actually cause these plaques, these amyloid plaques to form. Now that's a hint that the amyloid buildup can cause the disease, but there's a lot of evidence in other individuals that that's not the only thing that's happening and it might not be the initiating event in all individuals. So, um, so we need to better understand the, um, the cause of the, of the disease in, in different individuals. Because it also appears that there are distinct forms of the disease out there. And there are even individuals who have Alzheimer's disease but they seem to have what's called a mixed dementia. And so they have features of other dementias and neurodegenerative diseases as well like at the same time. So that adds to the complexity. Now we need better biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. This is an area where I do think that we're starting to do better. But what I mean by that is we do not have great tools for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease early. 
So biomarkers are thing, can be things like in the clinic, get a blood draw and look at specific proteins that are in the blood, or they can be um, things that could be viewed via um, imaging analysis. So there are lots of different types of biomarkers out there, um, but what we need is biomarkers that can um, pick up the disease very, very early, and those are currently underdeveloped in the field. And then as I mentioned, the brain atrophy that occurs in Alzheimer's disease, it's not reversible at this point in time. All right, so what about um, drug development? Why don't we, why aren't we doing better in the drug development space? Well, um, many of the reasons are, you know, relate to some of the challenges that we have in understanding the disease. Um, but in general, clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease are very slow and they're very difficult, right? Because of the slow progression of the disease, it takes a long time to actually um, recruit into the study, um, treat with the drug for a long period of time, and then actually look at outcomes in the trials. Unfortunately, some of the drugs that we've had go through trials recently that have been very promising have underperformed. Aducatumab is, is one of those, um, and that was pretty devastating for the field. Um, and so this is, um, this is, I think, caused the field to take a hit, especially when it comes to um, getting investors into this space. So the NIH is putting a lot of money into Alzheimer's disease research, but the private sector has sort of pulled back a little bit um, because some of the drugs have not done well in clinical trials. So, um, so we need to sort of figure out a way to get um, investor confidence up in the field. All right, so I'm sorry that this is all, <laughs> this all sounds like gloom and doom, and I hate to, <laughs> I know this is lunchtime, and, um, but we are doing better in some areas, okay? So um, a few areas where I, I think that the, you know, a lot of progress is being made and things are on the horizon. So first of all, the biomarker space is improving, and this is actually an area where I think we're making a big impact at Brown. The new Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research at Brown has a biomarker core, and that's a major goal of, of the center here. And I think we can really make an impact. There are investigators working on different types of biomarkers, AI-based biomarkers, looking at vasculature and non-invasive um, biomarkers, for example, looking through the eye. Um, so this is all being developed at Brown, and I think this is really going to, to make a difference. Um, there are some more promising drugs that are coming up right now. There's one that I'm actually feeling very um, excited about, um, lecanemab, that um, is going through trials right now, and the early data is looking really good. And um, the full data set is going to be out in the next couple of months. It's a drug that's being developed by Asai together with Biogen. So I actually think that there are some drugs coming out on the horizon that could really change things for the field. So, so that's great news. Um, and then in terms of the brain atrophy, this is a challenging space, but this is actually where, where we are working. And this is our, our sort of unique angle. Um, Justin and I are, um, are trying to tackle this question um, of whether or not it is possible to actually increase new neuron formation in degenerative disease to replace the neurons that have been lost. Now, this is a big challenge. Um, it's a very ambitious project that we have, but we, we do believe that if we can actually make a difference here, then um, we can improve um, the symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease, as well as other neurological conditions. So this is what I'll be talking about today. All right, so, so why do we think we can do this? Well, the first point that I want to make is that new neurons actually do form in a specific area of the brain, and that area of the brain is the hippocampus. So for a long time in humans, it was thought that okay, we, once you're an adult, you can't form new neurons. But it turns out that's not true. And there's been a lot of work on um, investigating the, the um, extent to which neurogenesis is happening in the human brain in the last few years. And we're now getting a better handle on um, how much is, is really going on in the human brain. And um, it's more than we had thought previously, it turns out. Um, but in my lab, we study the rodent brain. Uh, we mostly work on, on mice. And here, I'm showing you a schematic of this area which is the, the hippocampus, so zoomed in now on the hippocampus, and this is the area where this is happening. And that's important because, as I mentioned, this is the part of the brain where Alzheimer's disease is it's, it's hitting this part of the brain early on. All right, so the part of the brain um, that has these, or the part of the hippocampus that has these neural stem cells is known as the dente gyrus, so that's this lighter blue area here. And um, neurogenesis, which is the formation of new neurons, is possible here because of the presence of specialized types of cells known as neural stem cells. And neural stem cells are special because they can self-renew, meaning they can um, divide and give rise to more stem cells to replenish the population. Um, but they can also do what we call differentiate. And that means they can take on characteristics of first immature neurons, 
early neurons, and then eventually they can fully mature into neurons that fire. These are excitatory neurons, and they will integrate into the circuitry of the hippocampus. And, um, and so this is happening um, all over the, um, the dentate gyrus of the, the mouse brain, and it's happening in the human brain as well. And so this is just a visual of what these neural stem cells look like. This is an image that was taken by one of the students in my lab, Kelsey Babcock. So she just took a slice through um, the, a, a mouse brain, zoomed in on the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, and the cells are the cells that are green here, these are these neural stem cells. So this is a transgenic mouse that we have in the lab, and they're constantly um, expressing this protein or um, making this protein that glows green, um, specifically in the neural stem cells. So it's a great way for us to mark this, these cells and to, to follow them over time. All right, so, so what do these cells do? So as I mentioned, this part of the brain functions in learning and memory. And to give you an idea of the type of memory that these cells are important for, when you get up in the morning, you drive to work, you park your car, and you go into your office, and you work all day, you work hard, and you go back out, you have to remember where your car is parked, right? And you need to know, <laughs> sometimes, right, exactly. And so you need to know where your car is parked today, and not where you parked it yesterday. And as you get older, it turns out that becomes a little bit more difficult. Yeah, exactly, so now we have these, now we have these great tools to, to help us out. Um, but we didn't used to have those, and, um, and we rely on those, so that's, yeah, that's great. So, um, so and, and that seems like a trivial task, right? But we use that type of memory all the time, and if it deteriorates, that actually becomes very problematic on, on a daily basis. So, um, so it's actually important to retain that memory with age, and individuals who have Alzheimer's disease, um, they, they, they lose that form of memory, and that's a problem. Okay, so what about in the human? So I mentioned that um, for a long time it wasn't clear how many of these new neurons were forming in the human brain, but it, now we have much better tools for, um, for analyzing these cells. And so this is work that was done by Maria Lawrence Martins lab in Spain. And I know there's a lot on here, but the important panel is the one in red labeled new neurons. And so these little shapes here, these are representing new neurons that are marked by a protein known as double quartin. And, um, and there are lots of them in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus in the human brain. And what Maria did in this study was she looked across individuals that were undergoing just normal, healthy aging. They have some cognitive decline, but what would be considered within the, you know, the normal um, realm. And those are the people who are in the, the white circles here. And you can see that there is a decrease, right? So there is a decrease in the number of new neurons forming just with normal aging. Um, but then they also looked at people who had Alzheimer's disease and all different stages of Alzheimer's disease. And those are the people in, in red here. And they have many fewer neurons, right? So the, the number of new neurons um, is reduced in the people of Alzheimer's disease. And it seems to be an early feature of the disease. Um, because when they staged the, the individuals by how much pathology they had, the lighter circles, didn't have as much pathology, that they did have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and those people already have fewer new neurons forming. All right, so how can we model Alzheimer's disease in the lab? So, so this is what we do. So, um, so we have a couple of mouse models that recapitulate the major features of Alzheimer's disease. And so we're using these mouse models to study neurogenesis and new neuron formation, how it's defective in the disease, and then how we can increase neuron formation in the brain. So one model that we use in the lab is called the 3XTG mouse model. It actually has um, genes that are found in human early onset Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so these are genes with mutations that we know cause disease in humans who get it early on. And that's, that's a common way of, of modeling the disease. Um, these are the genes for um, people who are interested. And this is the progression of the Alzheimer's disease in, in the mouse, and which very much it parallels what happens in the human. So um, going from you know, birth here, up to 12 months, the mice start to get cognitive impairment around three months of, or sorry, four months of age. And we can measure that using different types of tests. You can put mice through mazes and have them try to learn new tasks. Um, mice are not really smart, but, but they can do some things and they, they can learn some things and, and retrieve memories. And, um, and they can do that in a way that can be uh, measured fairly, in a fairly straightforward way. 
Um, and then after that, around six months, these mice start to develop amyloid plaques that resemble the plaques found in Alzheimer's disease. They then get what we call gliosis, which is basically inflammation in the brain, again, resembling what happens in the disease. And then around 12 months of age, they develop these tangles in their neurons. And so, um, so it's not a perfect model of Alzheimer's disease, but the progression is actually pretty close to what happens um, in humans. So, so this is what we use. All right, so what happens to neural stem cells and new neuron formation in these mice? So again, we can, um, we can count cells in the brain by just slicing through and then marking the cells in different ways. Here's a, a cell, for example, shown here. And what we found was that in the Alzheimer's model, we saw a reduction in the number of neural stem cells in the hippocampus. And we also found a, number, um, a, a decreased number of new neurons forming in the Alzheimer's mice. And importantly, at least at this, um, these early stages, the neural stem cells are still present to some extent. And that was good news for us because what that means is that there still is a pool of neural stem cells that we could potentially tap into to form new neurons if we can figure out ways to activate them and get them down this neurogenic pathway. And so we've actually done this type of analysis um, and a number of different time points, so at a number of different ages in the mice. And what we find, interestingly, is that the new neuron formation um, starts to decrease around the time of the first cognitive impairments in the mice, and then it decreases over time. And this actually resembles what's happening in a human, right? So as I mentioned, in a human, the decrease in double cortin positive cells or new neurons is actually an early feature of the disease, and it seems to be an early feature of the disease in the animals as well. Okay, so what are we doing? So um, I'm not gonna go into too many details of the studies that, that we're doing today, but one thing we do with these mice is a lot of exploratory work to identify new targets um, to go after um, to try to increase neurogenesis. And so we do this using a number of different methods, including um, genomics, metabolomics, basically trying to sort of look at everything, comparing the healthy mouse to the, to the Alzheimer's mouse. We can also do mechanistic studies. So once we have targets of interest, we can go in and do things like gene knockouts and alter the function of very specific genes and ask how that changes neurogenesis. And then in addition, um, we have this goal of more therapeutic development and that's what we're doing with, um, with Bolden Therapeutics. And these are, all of these approaches are, are highly integrated. It's not necessarily a linear process. Everything is sort of happening at once. And, um, and you know, the mechanistic studies inform um, how we should do our exploratory work um, and, and vice versa. So it's a highly integrated process. And the target that I'll tell you about in the next few minutes is um, a target that we've been working on together with Justin Fallon, who is a professor in the neuroscience department here at Brown. Um, though he's at an NIH panel today, so he couldn't be here. All right, so, so what are we doing with Justin? So four or five years ago, I gave a talk at a graduate program retreat, and I was talking about neurogenesis and one of the molecular pathways that regulate neurogenesis, that regulates neurogenesis. And Justin approached me after the talk, and he said, hey, I have a molecule that I basically just discovered the function of recently, and it's in that pathway that you were just talking about, the modulates neurogenesis. And you know, maybe what we should do is see if in our mice where we've disrupted this molecule, are there changes in neurogenesis? So I said, sure, why not? Let's give it a go. And, and we did that. And, um, and that was sort of the beginning of a story that has now led to um, a lot of mechanistic work in our labs, as well as the, the founding of this company. So, um, so basically, this, this is what we did. So he had a, a gene that he had been working on called musk. The name of the gene isn't super important. But what we hypothesized based on what he knew about the gene and what I knew about neurogenesis was that there was a specific part of the gene, which is shown here in red, that might actually be inhibitory for neurogenesis. And so we thought, hey, what if we could just remove just that one part of the gene in red? Maybe we could increase neurogenesis. So conceptually, it's actually um, pretty simple. And we wanted to do this at the level of RNA. So the, the functional portion that's that's affecting neurogenesis is actually the protein. But in order to intervene with the, um, the pathway and neurogenesis, we thought that we would, it would be best to target um, the RNA level. And so the idea here is that without an RNA therapeutic, 
this RNA would then contain this inhibitory domain and would make a protein that also contains an inhibitory domain, and that would um, that reduces neurogenesis. And this is actually what's happening normally in the animals or or in humans. But the strategy is to remove that inhibitory domain, and then in the RNA that actually um, brings together just these blue portions of the of the RNA, and it forms a protein that no longer contains the inhibitory region. So we did this first genetically in a mouse, and now we're doing it with a therapeutic known as an antisense oligonucleotide. And what we've found is that mice that are lacking that red target domain actually form twice as many new neurons as their mice with, with the target domain in place. And not only that, these mice perform better in cognitive tasks. So again, these mice actually seem to be a little bit smarter as a result of this, this increase in neurogenesis. So we have founded um, Bolden Therapeutics. So we worked with Brown to um, apply for a patent, and that patent has now been issued, and we've now licensed it to Bolden. Um, these are the founders of Bolden, uh, myself and Justin. And then our third co-founder is a really amazing individual who is a Brown alum. And um, this is Johnny Page. He actually did some of the early work in the lab, in Justin's lab, and um, measuring cognition in, the, in these mice. And since that time, he actually started in medical school at Brown, but he's on leave right now because he's our the CEO of our company. He also has a background in business. And it turns out doing medical school and being a CEO full time, that's tough. Um, so he's, he's on leave right now um, working uh, at Bolden, and he's truly just an amazing guy. All right, so, so that's the, the founding team, and just a little bit about Bolden Therapeutics. So we are located in Lab Central, which is a nonprofit incubator lab space up in Cambridge, um, right near MIT. And um, it's, it's a great space that has been really transformative for us because without this space, we probably would not have been able to make early progress on developing the, the therapeutic. And so the way we were able to get this space is we applied for what's called a golden ticket. Um, we are sponsored by Biogen. And so what Biogen does is they had, so Biogen is a big pharma company and they have these golden ticket competitions. And you basically apply and you go and you, you pitch. Johnny pitched for us. He's very good at it. And, um, and it's a competition. And if you win and they like your idea, then they actually give you free lab space. Um, at Lab Central. And so Lab Central, it, it truly is an incubator. So it has everything you need, all the basic molecular biology, um, equipment, um, tissue culture, microscopes, everything you need. And, um, and so we were able to get one lab bench in this space. But it's great because we have, we have access to everything. And since that time, we've expanded a little bit. And now we rent a second bench. Um, but, but it's been a lot of fun um, having the team up there um, working in that space and next to other startups. So um, there are lots of startups in the same space, all working side by side on their products. Um, this is our science team. So, so we're still pretty small, um, but we do have one PhD level scientist. And then um, Emma Downey is, um, is a second scientist who's been with us for about a year. And then we just hired a third person, um, Dechalis Afray. And I don't have a picture of her yet because she's really kind of brand new. Um, but we have a small team working there and um, I think what everybody wants to know is, okay, what about the money? Where do you, how do you fund this? Um, so we still do basic science work here at Brown on the mechanisms by which this musk protein is regulating neurogenesis. And that's really important to understand what's going on. So, um, so we have funds for our work here at Brown. We actually started with a seed award from Brown. That was the, the very first funding that Justin and I were able to, to get to get this up and running. Um, we've had a Kearney Innovation Award. And then we went out and were able to obtain some funding from a foundation known as the Tome Foundation, as well as an R21 grant from the, the NIH that's still ongoing. Now with Bolden, early on, we were able to get a little bit of what we call friends and family funding, and that got us started at the very earliest stage. stage. Um, the golden ticket from Biogen was huge because that financed our lab early on. Um, but since that time, we've been able to get a couple of grants from the National Institutes of Health. So we have an STTR grant, which is a grant that actually bridges um, both academia and 
the private company. And so that's nice because it gives us a little bit of flexibility and fluidity between the, between the two. Um, but now Bolden has its own grant, an SBIR grant, which is a small business grant from the National Institutes of Health. And that's, um, that's how we're funding the company right now. Um, and so our goal right now is to get our um, antisense oligonucleotide into preclinical models, and then we'll move forward with um, a larger um, fundraise. Okay, and then just lastly, um, you know, what we hope is that we will be able to impact a number of areas um, in terms of neurological conditions that are associated with disease. So you know, I've talked a lot about Alzheimer's disease, but there are other, um, there are other neurodegenerative diseases that could also um, be helped by new neuron formation. Um, brain injury, there are a lot of um, conditions, so stroke, traumatic brain injury where neurons are lost. And if we can figure out ways to increase neurogenesis in those conditions, I think we can make a difference. Um, psychiatric diseases are something that's a little bit less obvious, um, but in fact, major depressive disorder um, where there's, there's no treatment, and also PTSD, um, these, these um, conditions involve a part of the hippocampus known as the ventral hippocampus. And so that's the part of the hippocampus that's important for emotional regulation. And there's increasing evidence now that, um, that neurogenesis is actually compromised in those conditions as well. And so um, we hope in the long term we can, um, we can make a difference there. All right, so I'll, hop, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, again, this is my lab here at Brown working on this project, as well as some of the other exciting work that we have going on in the lab. And I'll just highlight Kelsey Babcock, who's really done most of the work on the Alzheimer's models in, in my lab. Justin and Johnny um, are great collaborators. Ivana Delal is a neuropathologist at the Rhode Island Hospital who we're working together with. And then um, sources of funding for my lab as well. I'm happy to take questions. Where should we start? Kim, I'll start with my chair. So, so Ashley, what's the purpose of the inhibitory region in musk during normal? Like, is it is it important for normal development or nor normal development of the brain? Yeah, yeah. So, so good question. So, so the the great thing is that. Just, so Justin made the mouse that has just a specific knockout of that exon, so that inhibitory region. And the mice are, are pretty normal. Um, they have some changes in their muscle stem cell compartment as well. Um, but the main phenotype that's been observed is this increase in neurogenesis. And the, molecularly, what the inhibitory domain does is it binds to BMPs. So it's a BMP modulator. Um, and you probably have heard that from Justin as well, hearing him present the work. So, um, so it's actually a good thing that the mice are pretty normal because, um, because we think we can specifically target this area in the brain without causing other problems and side effects as a drug. Yeah. Really exciting. Okay. I guess to, to follow up on that, what is the purpose of the protein itself? In other words, you know, with or without the inhibitory Component. Right. That that protein is designed for some purpose. Right. And, so and do you disrupt that other purpose when you knock out the inhibitory yeah. component? And again, yeah. you show that slide about cancer. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. divide cell division is got yep. is, is you know the double uh, is double edged sword. Absolutely. Yeah. So. so great question. So a full knockout. Of if you completely take out this gene, that's lethal. So it is important for development, which is why it's important that we're making a precision tool to just remove this one small portion of the protein. And you know, I didn't get into the, the, any of the structural, um, what's known about the protein structurally, but it turns out that that exon codes for one specific IgG domain in the protein. So it's a modular, the, the exon structure is very modular. And so we can actually just take out that one exon and then that it's skipped during splicing and that makes an in-frame protein that seems to be totally normal. And because of the, the mouse that, that we made or that, that Justin made that we've been analyzing, we don't think that just removing that inhibitory domain is going to affect the overall function of the protein. Because again, because the mice seem to be normal otherwise. They're, they're healthy, they're running around. Um, they don't seem to have other problems. So, do yeah. you, but do you know what that protein is doing? 
So it's, it's a signaling protein, and one thing that it does is it modulates BMP signaling, but there are other domains that interact with other signaling factors. So like Wnt signaling, for example, is another, um, is another signaling pathway that's modulated by this receptor. So it's on the surface of the cell. It's a cell surface receptor, and it's, it's interacting with all of these different signaling proteins. So in different contexts, it's doing different things. Yeah. And then in terms of cancer, so, so we haven't seen, it's a great question, a really important question. We have not seen any evidence for um, increased cancer in, in the mice, and it's something that's, that's on our radar, but we don't have any evidence for that right now. That's important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, yes. great talk. Can you talk for a little bit about other kinds of dementia? You, you mentioned it yeah. um, here and there that some things could help those that are some of the de other dementias that are associated with aging. Right, so great question. And so the different dementias, they affect different types of neurons and they affect different parts of the brain. The reason that we think that, that Alzheimer's is a good target for us is, um, is not just because it's so important to tackle that disease, but because of the specific effect on the, the hippocampus. Um, Maria Lawrence Martin, again, who is um, my friend who's done a lot of the work on the human neurogenesis, she had a recent paper that just came out last year where she actually specifically looked across a number of dementias. She looked at ALS, she looked at frontotemporal dementia, and she saw changes in neurogenesis across, um, across the different neurodegenerative diseases, though the defects were slightly different in every different condition. So, um, so I guess the, the bottom line is that they all seem to have a defect, but there are differences in the details of what's going on. Yeah, but it's, it's early days in terms of, you know, like what we could actually do in those different diseases, but it's an important question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody really? Mark has the mic. Oh, yeah. Then, okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> Pass it off to Mark. I'll yeah. send it over there. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, the way that the therapeutic is working yeah. is so elegant because it takes advantage of this modular nature of the protein mm -hmm. and you're just excluding that one exon. So I guess I'm, I'm curious about whether it's only promoting exon skipping or if you also see a decrease in the abundance of the transcripts that do include the exon you want to get rid of. It's That's kind of a fine... No, this is like, no, now you're getting into Bolden. Okay, so, no, this is so important. So, um, so this is something that we always check. And so what Bolden is doing right now, the stage that we're at is really um, going into human cells and we're screening for our compounds and we're screening for um, sequences, antisense oligonucleotide nucleotide sequences that don't do that, right? That, that we are sort of precision tools to get rid of the exon, but don't affect the overall levels. And some do and some don't. So, um, so for sure. And, um, and that's sort of, you know, that's what the screen is all about right now. It's finding the best candidates. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's, that was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I, I know in, in other lines of research, aged rats with cognitive impairments have hyperactive uh, CA3. Yeah. And, uh, and this has been identified in humans. And I wonder if your mice show that and if that is, goes away in, in the model. So you're talking about neuronal hyperactivity or behavioral hyperactivity? Neuronal. Neuronal in the CA3. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have we so we have not measured that. We have definitely have not measured that in the musk mouse model with the um, the exon that we took out. I'm trying to think. I mean, there, there's certainly evidence of increased hyperactivity in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's that's definitely a, a feature of the disease, and it's thought to contribute to the death of the neurons because too much activation um, causes damage. Um, we have not looked in our mouse model. That's a great question. Yeah. Hi, um, my question is uh, like uh, this therapeutic molecule is like you're going to give it uh, intravenously or intramuscularly? The delivery. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, this is really important. So, so right now, ASOs um, need to be delivered intrathecally. Um, so that's a, a lumbar puncture. But there is a lot of work in this space right now to figure out ways uh, to get them across the blood-brain barrier. Yeah. Um, and in the long term, that's, that's the goal. Um, and there are a number of companies working on, on doing that and driving that technology forward. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another question is, as we know, like I read the, some literature about Alzheimer that it usually start the age of 40 and then later on with the age, it increases. So is there any test or we come to know that uh, that in, that the early age, the Alzheimer is started or then we will, then the patient will not suffer on the means uh, um, late stage, like above the octogenarians. So, um, so in terms of biomarkers for the yeah. disease, yes. so so this is what we, what we don't have right now. This is what we need to the field needs to to figure out is um, is ways to detect the disease earlier on, and we don't have great like, blood tests, for example, for Alzheimer's disease um, at the early stages. It's really only in, you know once. Once you get a person into a, a scanner and you can do a PET image and actually see what's going on in the brain in terms of the development of the plaques that, you, that a person can be um, truly diagnosed with the disease. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Ashley, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, especially as somebody who hasn't taken a biology course since high school, uh, I very much appreciated uh, your ability to to really um, zoom out from the technical aspects and, and, and give us the whole picture. Uh, so it's just terrific. My question is about the, um, the, the stage sort of between you've got a treatment that you think is very promising and then you have kind of a whole branching set of potential applications, potential yeah, medical yeah. Uh, outcomes that you would like to see. And I just wonder whether you could tell us a little bit more about sort of how you think about, uh, you know, of that large branching tree that might be right. promising, how do you know which routes to go down yeah. uh, and to, to find the best ones? No, this, this is a, a great question. It's something that we talk about. It a, we talk about this a lot with the, the Bolden group because it's, it's actually not, the answer to that question is not obvious, right? It's, it's complicated. And, and part of the reason for that is... Um, some of the challenges that I mentioned with Alzheimer's trials. So, so sure, we could go into an Alzheimer's trial, but it's it's more difficult to fund. It'll take a really long time, and we want to know now. You know, we want to know soon. And so, actually, some of these other um, conditions, like stroke, for example, anoxia is actually probably a pretty good one, or even major depressive disorder. Um, those are actually potentially more accessible and have better biomarker readouts, even though we feel a little bit more confident about our ability to, to treat the Alzheimer's. So, um, so it's actually a tricky question, and we're not at the clinical trial stage yet. So, um, so we haven't, you know, we haven't made any final decisions right now. But, um, but it's it's not straightforward to decide. Fantastic. I look forward to buying stock. And- <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Questions? No. Oh, okay. Is there scientific evidence that meditation or mindfulness might reduce plaques? I do, I do not know of evidence that it reduces plaques. I mean, there are certainly reports generally in the mindfulness space, and this isn't my area, but but that people do better generally with age, um, people who practice mindfulness. Um, but I don't know of any evidence on actual plaque burden. Yeah, it's a great. I mean, it wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, to <laughs> um, it's it's a good thing in general. So yeah. Quick question, oh, Ashley. Yeah. I had, yeah. Great talk. I had a question Thanks. about the approach of. Thinking about neurogenesis and and mm-hmm. and how what role it plays here, and thinking about the kinds of expectations you might have for, you know, if the, when the when, if the issue is is atrophy and mm-hmm. uh, the loss of function and all of these neurons yeah. that are you know with the, with the tangles and and are you know not functioning properly, yeah. new neurons can be expected to do some things, right. but the question is. Are there limits to what you might expect? Right. And are, should yeah. you focus on laying down new memories and not expecting old functions to be replaced by these new, new neurons? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a great, great question. And you're totally right. So in terms of what's known about endogenous neurogenesis, it's, it's limited to the dead date. And we think that's a great area for it to be happening. And we want it to happen in a, a, sp- a safe way because we don't want to increase things like cancer. And so I think in terms of the immediate next step, we are limited to that part of the brain. We are limited to the trisynaptic circuit and that you know, those types of memories that are formed and indexed by the, by the hippocampus. 
longer term, once, you know, like, if we can get this initial first stage established, I think there are next steps that could be taken. Um, so for example, I didn't get into this, but neural stem cells are a subtype of astrocytes. And if you take a neural stem cell out and you tr do transcriptional profiling on it, it is almost identical to an astrocyte in another part of the brain. Not identical, but it's very, very similar. And there, is, there are a number of lines of evidence that have shown that in the context of stroke, astrocytes can actually undergo neurogenesis that are considered non-neural stem cell astrocytes. And so thinking really big picture, and this is ambitious, but there is potential, I think, for any astrocyte in the brain, given the right cues, to form a new neuron. It's just it has to be done in a safe way and it has to be done in a very precise way. So, so that's further out, but, um, but it's something that we're thinking about in the long term. And others are thinking about that as well, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, so in the brain, there's always many, many levels between like cellular and molecular uh, mm -hmm. you know, changes uh, and cognition, right? Uh, cognitive performance and cognitive yeah. improvement. Um, and there's a lot of kind of biomarkers in between. Uh, uh, in, in this case uh, for neurogenesis, what are the biomarkers in between that um, you'll look to to um, to see that these new neurons have integrated with um, the you know relevant circuits um, and and eventually actually lead to uh, uh, cognitive performance? Uh, like, are are there kind of like um, links along the way that you right. can follow to make sure that? Um, it's having, it's directly impacting uh, cognitive performance. Yeah, so in, in the mouse, it's really straightforward. We have lots of markers that we can use in between and that we can use the cognition as a readout. In humans, and this is again why some of the clinical trials are, are challenging with Alzheimer's disease, there are cognitive readouts and very specific tests <laughs> that are used in those trials. And those are the main readouts. You know, in the case of some of the recent drugs like aducanumab and lecanemab that are real like, you know, plaque clearing drugs, then they can do a scan and look the, the you know, the decrease in the plaques. But we don't predict that our drug's gonna do that at all. It's not gonna decrease the plaques. Um, so for us, it's, it's things more like blood flow to that part of the brain, which increases um, with neurogenesis. And there are labs that are actually working on biomarkers of neurogenesis using um, imaging. In, in people. And so um, so we're anticipating and, and we're hoping that those are gonna come online soon because that will be really helpful for us to get that in between, you know, before the, to link the cognitive performance with the actual um, neurogenesis and that, that type of plasticity. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Some more, uh, a broader question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the rest of our body, um, you know, the healing takes place anytime we injure ourselves. Why is the brain so doesn't have enough stem cells. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm serious. It, you know, in, in your skin, if you have a wound, those stem cells are activated and they make new, new skin cells. But in the brain, um, it's really only, there may be a second region of the brain that has neurogenesis that I didn't, didn't really talk about today. Um, but in humans, the best evidence is that it's, it's just this one region. And it's, it's really due to, you know, once the circuitry of the brain is set up, you know, we want it to stay just so, right? And, um, and so the brain, it's, you know, evolution has just not set it up for that type of plasticity. But there are other species that have more plasticity in their brains via neurogenesis. So, I mean, for example, um, songbirds, where adult neurogenesis was, was first studies, in male songbirds, they have lots of neurogenesis, and they actually use that, the males use that neurogenesis to actually make new songs every year. And um, it's all fascinating literature on, on birds and, the, um, and uh, specifically neurogenesis in, in males. Um, but we just, we, we don't do that. So, um, so it's very species dependent, but in humans, it seems that really like what's, what you get when you finish development is mostly what you have, except in a couple of specific areas of the brain. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. I, I'm not, I don't know a lot about this area, um, but 
but I believe there is, and there are there are labs that are that are studying the development of the plaques and other areas of the body um, that also cause complications in Alzheimer's disease. So um, yes, but I don't know a lot about that area. It's, yeah, it's important. Yeah. Well, I can just Yeah, so it's a really good question. It's not very well understood. Um, neurogenesis is specifically happening in the hippocampus part of the brain, but the hippocampus, you know, the brain has, a, there's so much connectivity between the different parts of the brain, and there is some recent work, this is very early, but there is a really nice paper that came out just um, earlier this year in, in Nature looking at the connectivity between the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, so that like sleep area of the brain. And it turns out there is actually a lot of crosstalk between the two different areas. So um, we don't know a lot about that, but I think in the next few years, um, there are gonna be a number of studies um, coming out that suggesting that there are a lot of links because the hippocampus certainly is involved in, um, in the process of, of sleep. So yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.